As a PA or an NP, have you ever wondered what it's like to work in ENT, otherwise known as otolaryngology? I've thought about it before, and I've wondered, is it kind of a cool specialty, or is it something that could be really annoying with lots of chronic problems that can't be fixed? Well, today I'm going to talk to an ENT PA, and she is going to tell us why she loves this specialty and why she thinks it is highly underrated as a specialty for PAs and NPs to work in and the reasons why it may be a great specialty for you. We're gonna cover the kind of cases you see, the procedures, whether you can assist in the OR, what a general schedule is like in caseload, and what kind of personalities do well in this field. If that interests you, then please stay tuned. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea McKinnon, and I've been a PA for about seven years. Well, thanks, Andrea. I appreciate your time and joining us today. Good to see you. I'm excited to be here. We are going to talk about uh, ENT, right? Uh, the specialty that you work in. Tell us a little bit briefly about your career, what you started, where you're at now, and how you ended up in ENT. Oh my gosh, I love this story. I really love talking about it because I love my specialty, ENT. I learned about the PA profession while I was in the Air Force, and I served as an optometry technician at that time. When I was looking to rotate, um, um, in my second year at MPA studies, I really didn't know what I wanted to do for my electives. Kind of knew I didn't want to rotate in optometry and ophthalmology as a PA. So I thought, well, let me do something very similar. And that's really how I came across rotating in ENT. And that's how I learned about the profession and and how broad, how many wonderful things that we can do. Yeah. Yeah. And so you stayed in kind of the same general area. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot in that area. There, there is a lot. It's a small amount of real estate, but a lot happens in that area. That's right. Um, so what are you doing now? Are you still working in ENT? I do. I actually work one day a week. Um, a couple of years ago, I took a full-time position, assistant professor. Um, and now I'm the director of clinical education in the Wake Forest PA program. Um, but I'm really happy that I'm able to still practice uh, one day a week as an ENT provider. Yeah, I've talked to people who have transitioned into full-time academia, but they still love having that clinical aspect at least like once a week or once every other week. Yeah, um, yeah. It was really important for me. Okay, so in your ENT practice, we're going to talk about all aspects of it, but I want to start talking about like population that you see. I think I saw on your profile, you work in adult ENTs exclusively, correct? I do. I work in pretty much adult, but right after I graduated, I decided that I wanted to enter into a fellowship training for ENT. And I did that for a year. So I'm trained to take care of pediatrics as well as adults. I'm also trained to take care of inpatient and surgical assist as well. Is a fellowship or residency, whatever people want to call it, is that something you would recommend uh, people if they're looking at this specialty? Yeah, I get this question a lot. For me, it was really important to have that extra year of training for a couple of reasons. As Many of us know PA training is very difficult. Your confidence takes a big hit and you kind of get out of the program and you feel uh, just, I don't know. Like I, I, I don't know if I'm ready. And I think we all kind of felt that way. For me, it was really important to kind of build that confidence and that self-esteem again. And, you know, ENT is a very difficult, exciting, but difficult specialty. And you really, if you want to practice independently and you really want to practice um, competently, for me, it was really important to have that one year training. Yeah, I think a lot of people are split on, on how they feel about residencies and fellowships. I think if I could have done it over again, I would have liked to have gone to a residency or a fellowship. I really think that that would have been good for my personality. You know, but there are other people that um, land in really good uh, positions where they have a great uh, physician and other PAs and NPs are working with that really help them to learn and grow. So it's not like, and I'm sure you would agree, it's not like you have to, but I think they can be really great. And and especially if you're somebody who, who wants to have that extra training and, and feel super confident when you go into yeah. this specialty. So going back to, I, I, got, I get sidetracked all the time because when people say stuff, I have so many questions I want to ask, but I want to get back to the population a little bit. So in, in ENT, is it usually divided where people are either doing pediatrics or they're doing adults? So 
I can only speak for the maybe three or four clinics that I've encountered since I've been practicing. And so for the most part, especially if you're attached to an academic center, then you do have that separation because even just taking care of pediatric population, they're a huge number. And the things that you encounter with them, they're not just many adults, like they have their own type of pathophysiology. Um, And so in our clinic specifically, we have two amazing APPs that take care of all of our pediatric um, patients um, and they do it really well. And so it works wonderful the way we have it kind of set up where we have six APPs that are taking care of adults, two that are taking care of our pediatrics just works really well for the continuity of care in our clinic. Yeah, that's great. I, I didn't even think about it. I was thinking it had to be either or, or um, you know, either they're separate or one clinic sees all of them. But I didn't think about that option of in the clinic where they take any ages that they may have some providers set to either see the pediatrics or the adult patients. Cool. Okay. So what about inpatient versus outpatient? I mean, I assume yeah. most ENT clinics are outpatient, but do you know, is there an option for people to work strictly inpatient in ENT? Yeah, I think, and I love this question because it really allows me to show how PA and nurse practitioner friendly our clinic is. We do have an, again, amazing PA who does takes care of our inpatient surgical, like post-op patients. And that's really all she does. And let me tell you the benefit of that. It's not just that she will round on those patients and help with trait care, but really the readmission rate before we had her come on the board was really high. And we found that it was basically because there wasn't a lot of education as far as how to take care of yourself in the post-op setting. Uh, and she's just really filled in that gap. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's we, we are everywhere because we are needed everywhere. Yeah. That's what I love doing this channel and doing these videos is finding about all of the different things that PAs and NPs are out there doing. It is, it is pretty amazing. Okay. I want to dive in in a few minutes and talk about like the actual kind of cases and things seen in, in ENT. But first, let me ask you a little bit about your schedule. Um, I know this is going to be different depend on, you know, what clinic you work in, what setting you work in, but in general, kind of what are the schedules that you're seeing in the clinics that you work in as mm-hmm. far as, you know, how many days a week, what times are people coming in and and leaving? Yeah. So for the most part, we have no call. Um, For the most part, we don't round except for our one PA who is inpatient. She does round on her patients. And so it is a very satisfying, I think, schedule. I start my clinic at eight o'clock in the morning. I might see between 15 and 19 patients per day. Um, And we are very cognizant about not putting a whole bunch on the schedule because like I said, ENT is not the easiest type of specialty. And so you need time to be able to build rapport with your patients, get that crucial medical history, do some procedures even, and be able to competently or confidently come to your assessment and plan. And so we are not seeing 30 patients and anything like that. You just wouldn't be able to deliver good, quick care to your patient. Which I think most providers out there are are right now saying, amen, hallelujah. (laughs) And that would be, we all feel that way in every specialty, but it's great to to know that you are given the time to to do that. And so what about, what about your autonomy? autonomy kind of in in your practice again this will differ from practice to practice but are you practicing very autonomously are you seeing new patients as well or are you really in the more follow up role so the variety of my schedule when i come in is really immense i am seeing new patients maybe 5 or 6 a day lots of return patients i can see pre op and post op um and so i there are not any patients patients that will call into the clinic and the scheduler will say, oh, no, you can't see the PA, right? And so it really does speak to how well we are trained. In my clinic, um, most of us that came in did accept a either one year or a modified 
you know, nine to 12 month intense training or fellowship slash residency. And so the goal of that was for us to have that autonomy and for us to be able to depend on one another, have conversations with one another, um, discuss cases in like our room and go back and talk to our patients. But also that open communication with our physician colleagues really exists there. They know that when we come to them with a question, there's no guilt, there's no shame. It's just that we're, we're all trying to work together to take care of our patient the best way we know how. Wow. It does sound like you you are in a really good environment, which I think a lot of- I'm very fortunate. Yeah. A lot of providers are probably watching this going, wow, that sounds like heaven. (laughs) Um, This is why I'm still here. It's the same clinic that I trained in, same clinic I've been in this entire time. I don't plan on leaving. Yeah. That does sound fabulous. I'm so happy for you that you found that opportunity. So this is Wake Forest that you're working in, and it's an academic health center, which I often try to tell people, or I often think my Myself, that new grads, it's just a great place to look to land often at these academic yeah. centers. And uh, there's so much learning going on. It can really That's help hard. your career to a good start, right? Yes. I mean, this is how I even got the bug for teaching. So during my fellowship, part of the requirements to even complete it was I had to give a lecture here at Wake Forest, the PA program. And I can't tell you how nervous I was <laughs> about <laughs> doing that. And I remember one of my mentors us just saying, Andrea, you know more than the students know. Just just relax and just go with it. And that was my first lecture, which is dizziness. It's, it's one of the kind of like the subspecialties that I specialize in. Oh, okay. Well, this might be a good time then to move in and talk about in ENT world in general, what are the things that, you know, are, are seen in ENT? Yeah. So the, the big bucket things that you'll see um, are diseases and patient concerns that encompass laryngology. So if someone comes in with swallowing disorder, you know, laryngitis or so voice change, um, that type of thing, this people will refer them to us and we are definitely the specialists to take care of that. Yeah. Rhinology, so people think about ENT, you automatically think about the nose and the sinus, but also everything that is around the sinuses, like the, the nose, the turbinates, all of that anatomy, we take care of all of that surgically and non-surgically. And of course, the ears. Uh, So not just cleaning out wax, but also (laughs) evaluating hearing and then the inner organs, which is has a lot to do with your balance. So thinking about vertigo and all of the different types of ways vertigo can manifest itself. So I like to call my specialty otolaryngology head and neck cancer because head and neck cancer is a huge component of what we do. So we do a lot of biopsies, a lot of patient education. So kind of thinking about your parotid gland, your thyroid gland, even people who don't smoke, we know that HSV, the prevalence in the community is allowing the uh, numbers of cancers to rise in in the population. So tongue cancers and that type of thing. So I'm really proud because head and neck cancer, just kind of doing a surgical removal of the site can lead to by itself, most times um, surgical cures for cancers. So I don't think a lot of specialties can say that. Right. Yeah. Which has to be satisfying and and less depressing. You can actually cure the patients. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something too, that people might not think about. You say, you know, when you call it by the common name ENT, we forget about the mouth, uh, but there is a lot going on in the mouth that that ENT is doing. Definitely a lot going in there, thinking about tonsillectomies and all of that, all of that stuff. And we hadn't talked about the pediatric world. You know, someone brings their baby in um, who is not able to latch when they're breastfeeding. We're the ones who cut the frenulums as well. So just just a lot going on. (laughs) Yeah, I I wouldn't have even thought of that. I think when I think (laughs) pediatric ENT, I think putting tubes in ears, you know, (laughs) but I'm sure there's a lot more involved. Yeah. So what about on the surgical side? What kind kind of uh, main surgeries are happening in in otolaryngology? (laughs) Well, our surgeons are subspecialized. um, And so we have, of course, our head and neck cancer surgeons who make up the majority of most practices because there's just a lot that 
goes into that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of talking about laryngology, surgeries like removing the larynx because there is cancers around the vocal cords and then putting in a trach, those types of things. But also if you, if we have a patient who is not able to, for some reason, close both of their vocal cords, we will talk about a surgery to make that one vocal cord that's not moving kind of be closer to the other one that is. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah I never even heard that. Yeah, <laughs> rhinology. So your standard run of the mill sinus surgeries, straightening the nose. If some people can't breathe through their nose, typically we will assess the turbinates. And if they're really large, we'll reduce them. Lots of really cool surgeries in rhinology. And then, you know, for the ears, putting in tubes. If you have had long standing ear infections, sometimes the mastoid that bony cavity sitting behind your ear will become just really, I guess, mushy and, and squishy. And so the surgeon needs to go in there and, and root everything out. It's called a mastoidectomy. And I probably haven't touched on half of the, the surgeries that we do for obstructive sleep yeah. apnea, for yeah. instance. I mean, we, we, what we are able to do really encompasses a lot of like family medicine, things that you wouldn't think about, right? Okay. Endocrinology, for instance, takes out thyroids, but we do too, oh. right? So yeah, and a then, lot of, a lot of surgery. Yeah. And uh, placing cochlear implants and things like that. Cochlear implants, bone anchored, hearing aids. Yes. Those are the surgical devices to help with hearing. But one other thing that can help with hearing is if one of the three middle ear bones don't move, we can also replace one of those bones um, as well. Never knew so, that was an option either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, these are not things that PAs are doing, right. but these are surgeries that we really need to be aware of. So we know who to refer to which surgeon, right? And then how to really counsel our patient on some of the risks and benefits of those procedures. Yeah. Now, are there opportunities for PAs and NPs to, to first assist in ENT? A hundred percent. Yes. Now we are at an academic institution. And so we have a ton of residents <laughs> who are just kind of getting in there and getting their first assist. But as a fellow, I was able to uh, also first assist the big cases, the big surgical cases that really need a lot of help are the head and neck cancer surgery can mm -hmm. cases. Those are really long cases, big cases, lots of things going on. If you're going to graft from the thigh or from the arm into a place on the face, you really need a lot of trained hands on the patient. And so I would say if you're interested in being a first assist, it would probably be a head and neck cancer, a specialty that you want to get attached to. And you would hopefully feel a part of the team. That's a question that you really need to ask when you're interviewing yeah. and you're thinking about entering ENT. And that's something that you're, you're wanting to do is how much, you know, first assist experience will I be able to get? Going back to the, the clinic, uh, what kind of procedures can PAs and NPs do in office in ENT? So I do love to talk about the procedures that we do because it's one of the biggest things that drew me to this specialty. We do a lot of cool things. One example is a transnasal flexible laryngoscopy to assess the larynx. Microscopy. Wait, wait, wait. So meaning you're you're taking a camera up the nose down into look at the... Yes! Yeah, that... We have a camera. <laughs> yes, it looks like this big you know, big instrument here with an elephant shaped type of tube. And I always tell my patients, just a small portion is going through your nose. Most of this is for me to drive the instrument. But yes, um, we, we are able to put a tube with a camera on the end through the nose all the way down to the larynx and be able to really assess the movement and the function of the larynx. Oh, nice. Other procedures are otoscopy using a microscope, a binocular microscope. I think that is the one biggest tool, the one tool that we have in otolaryngology that makes us look like super PAs or super nurse practitioners, because we will look at an ear and tell the referring provider, oh no, that wasn't a hole in the eardrum or no, that wasn't a cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma is like a skin cyst, you know, in the ear. We'll say it was 
something else. And they'll say, how did you see that? And it's really because we have some cool instruments <laughs> um, using both of our eyes with this really high powered microscope that we use even in the operating room um, to evaluate our patient's ears. And I think that is uh, for somebody coming from like a family practice background, there are a lot of things that we have to to make judgments on and, and things using less than stellar instrumentation, I guess, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we are limited. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the nice things about the specialties is that they usually have all the, the gadgets and the things you need to really be able to differentiate stuff mm -hmm. and to do your job well. So uh, if anyone's coming in family practice and they're thinking about ENT, I think that's important for them to understand that you have the you have the technology and the gadgets to be able to really see what's going on in there. Yes. Yeah. And so not just that looking at the ears, we have a camera to look at the nose called the um, the rhinoscope. Um, we can look, if you haven't had sinus surgery, all we can really do is look at the turbinates and look at the nose. But once we've done like a, a really good breakdown of your sinus walls through a, with a sinus surgery, we can see into the maxillary sinus, into the ethmoid sinus. It's really neat. Take yeah. pictures and, and show our patients. And if there's mucus in there, we can suck it out. Um, and patients feel so much better. I think with everything that we do, the procedures, are really cool, but our patients leaving satisfied and, and feeling better um, because of our care is probably the best part of our job. I have seriously considered ENT before in my career, and I think part of what uh, interested me about it was the diversity of what you could see. Yeah. But the thing that probably is the number one fear I have, or the thing that keeps coming to my head when I think about ENT is I don't want to deal with people with chronic sinus stuff that you can't fix all day long. <laughs> Again, coming from family practice, because I'd see people who had been to the ENT and they're like, yeah, I still got this. I can't get, you know, get rid of it or whatever. Tell me, I is that a, is that a legitimate fear or is that overblown? So I think everything is about perspective. <laughs> and so if we have the perspective that our job as APPs are only to fix things, then yes, I think it would be very frustrating. You know, my training um, and experience has taught me that shifting that perspective to walking this road with your patient and helping them have a really good understanding of their new normal and that these are the limitations within medicine, but we're going to do everything that we can for you, I think really helps our patients really know that we're allies for them and keep coming back in spite that we can't fix everything. We can't cure it all, but they know that we're giving them the absolutely best care that we have available. And you're right. I mean, it's not only changing our provider mindset about that, about we don't have to be the fixer of everything because it's just not possible. <laughs> um, and I think patients do much better when you explain the whole situation and, and yes. tell them what reality is and what can and can't be done and, and things. I think if they understand that most of the time people change their perspective a little bit. Yeah, too. I've yeah, had so. really good outcomes with just sitting down with them and, and just inviting them into what we have available and, and just that team based approach where we're partnering to figure out how we can get you um, the best quality of life. So beyond, you know, not being able to fix everything <laughs> and changing your mindset, what are some of the challenges or frustrations that people might find in ENT? Well, for me, my biggest challenge was just kind of looking around at my colleagues, uh, my physician colleagues, my APP colleagues, and just really not seeing that racial diversity. For me, that was, it wasn't surprising, but it is kind of a glaring thing that I have to confront every time I go uh, to the clinic. Uh, and so if we kind of think about the lack of racial diversity just in the PA profession, which we know is very low, you can just imagine the abysmal low percentage of uh, racial diversity within this surgical specialty. And so we've got to do better, um, not just because it's important for, you know, PAs to of color to just know about our profession, but our patients need to be able to see people that look like them. And we know that the population that we're seeing these days are increasingly uh, more racially diverse. So if somebody's watching this and they are already a practicing PA or NP in another specialty, any advice you have for them about how they can move into ENT? So if you're already a practicing PA or nurse practitioner and you're thinking maybe ENT 
ENT is for you, I think the first step would be to register for the ENT for the PAC conference. It occurs every spring, and I believe they're on their ninth or 10th year right now. This conference is done extremely well. They cover a lot of the the main topics that you need to know as a ENT, but they also have hands-on training. So you can learn how to do a rigid rhinoscopy or a transnasal laryngoscopy, even using the binocular otoscope in order to assess ears. And you can really just do a trial run and just say, let me just see if I enjoy the medicine, if I enjoy the nuance of what you know our patients are going to come in with, and if I enjoy the type of procedures that um, I'm going to have to learn and do on a, on a daily basis in ENT. Yeah. The ENT for the PAC also offer CME um, and they have their own kind of academy that you can join. I, I re really highly recommend that. Um, but even more broadly, uh, the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery is also something that you might want to get involved in. They also have an annual conference, and that's when you really get to network with surgeons um, who are our physician colleagues who are going to do all of the hiring. Yeah. yeah. So you get to network and and figure out, you know, the, the really cool places to work that will invest in your growth as a person and as a provider. Right. right. So yeah. always want to make sure that you enjoy the medicine, but you've really got to enjoy the people that you work with, too. As we wrap up here, reasons why you think people should really consider ENT as their specialty. Okay, my elevator pitch. So otolaryngology head and neck surgery is a prime place for uh, APPs to practice because we um, do a lot of procedures. And so if you like your hands-on um, approach to medicine, it's good for you to come and join us. We have a lot of puzzle solving um, in our practice as well. Um, and I think the third thing is that we are needed, right? So you know, you want to be someplace where you feel like you can get in, you know, um, find a gap, find a niche um, and be really good at it. Um, and so for those reasons, I would say ENT or otolaryngology head and neck surgery is a really good specialty to practice in. Well, great. Thank you so much, Andrea. I appreciate your time and you sharing your information with us. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. Great. If you're still searching for what specialty is right for you, or you just want to hear more about PAs and NPs working in medicine, then you can check out these videos here or go to the playlist on my main channel page. Again, thanks for joining me. Take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.